it and here it is. <laughs> this is Battle Road. Um, we've been able to restore it. So this was the 18th century battlefield, what we're standing on right now. We've been, we've been in significant sites and parts of it crossing through fields, but this is the actual road right here. And so that way is east. So that's, that way is Boston. Boston's that way. So from here, the British still have about 14 and a half miles to go. Uh, they've already been under fire for at least an hour and a half at this point, uh, just constantly getting sniped at. Um, and so the road, this way is north. So that's east, that's north. So you can see the road made that turn to the north and then it makes its second turn here heading back east. So we've read Foster's account of Bloody Angle. So he and his Reading people and also the folks from Concord and Acton, Lincoln, Bedford, Framingham, Sudbury, they're all taking up positions in the field and behind the trees. Also coming up at this part of the action and taking up a position on this side of the road in that young growth of wood was Major Luami Baldwin and the Woburn Militia, about 325 men that had come up. They were Originally they had come up and they took a rest on Brooks Hill and then they saw the British regulars coming so they went down the east side of Brooks Hill and then came up and then took up a position in here. So this is his account, Major Luami Baldwin of the town of Woburn. We proceeded down the road and could see behind us the regulars following off of Brooks Hill. We came to Tanner Brook, the Brooks Tannery, at Lincoln Bridge and then concluded to scatter and make use of trees and walls for it to defend us and attack them. We did so and pursued on, flanking them. Mr. Daniel Thompson was killed and others. Till we came to Lexington, I had several good shots. The enemy marched very fast and left many dead and wounded and a few tired. So they come down, they take up a position. So again, this is one of the few wooded sections of Battle Road. There's a young growth of wood. There was also an orchard further down to the south where the road made that first turn. So they hide behind the stone walls flanking the road, scatter behind the trees. And when the British came up, they let them have it. Now, from the British. So we've had Edmund Foster, and we've had Major Loami Baldwin. Now here's Lieutenant Sutherland of His Majesty's 38th Regiment. He was in a very difficult situation. He had a chest wound. He was shot at the North Bridge. Um, he wasn't expected to live. Um, the good news is he actually does. Um, he was uh, described as, uh, by one of his contemporaries in the Boston Garrison as Lieutenant William Sutherland, the, hum the husband of the very pretty Mrs. Sutherland. <laughs> so there might have been a few people that were upset that he lived. Um, who knows? So he's in a, a chase or a one-horse cart uh, where they put you know, his, you know, the wounded officers. And so he's in the column. I'm not sure exactly where in the column he was. Um, there's really no safe place. You go in the front, you can be shot. You go in the rear, you're certainly going to get shot. Middle, maybe, who knows. He's in the column. He's coming up. And he says, I saw upon my right hand, a vast number of armed men drawn out in battalion order, I dare say near a thousand, who, who on our coming nearer dispersed into the woods. So Baldwin says we dispersed into the woods, Sutherland says we dispersed into the woods, and came as close to the road on our flanking parties as they possibly could. Upon our ascending the height to the road, they gave us a very heavy fire. But some shot from the left hand drew my attention that way when I saw a much larger body drawn up to the left. So, getting shot on the right by Baldwin, shot on the left by Edmund Foster and the folks that he's with. And so now they're basically caught between two fires. So they suffer about eight dead, probably about three times that and wounded, just in this little stretch of road. And then they continue on. And then the fields open out as they continue on to the east. And so they send out their flankers with greater effect and take some of the pressure off the column. But still, there's a lot of heavy fighting along this stretch of road. Captain Wilson of Bedford, uh, of the Bedford Minuteman Company, he was killed in this area. And according to uh, traditional stories uh, from the town of Bedford, um, when he mustered his company early in the morning and headed for Concord, I guess they stopped at a tavern to have a quick breakfast. And he said, he apologized to his men for the cold breakfast. He said, it's a cold breakfast, my lads, but we'll give the British a hot one. We'll have every dog of them before night. Um, but he never made it, and so he didn't come home. So he's one of the big heroes in the town of Bedford today, and he was killed right in this area. Do you know what that was? That just oh, the British. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for bringing me to that. British dead. A lot of people ask what happened to them. Well, there they are. Uh, a lot of them are buried um, in just common graves along the side of the road after the fighting had passed by or the next day. Some of them were buried 
in town cemeteries, like some that were killed later on down the road that were put in the Lincoln Town Cemetery by Ephraim Hartwell. Uh, but there's about eight and that are buried somewhere out in the field. And we didn't go and dig them up, just from local tradition um, and records, we know they're somewhere out there. So we've marked the gravesite near here are buried British soldiers. We've identified six approximate gravesites within the park. And there's probably dozens more that we don't know of going all the way back towards Charlestown. Now, Benjamin Franklin, very dryly, um, the, some of the uh, British politicians, members of parliament, were saying, well, you know, when they got reports of the battle, were saying that the Americans were cowardly and they were fighting behind stone walls. And Benjamin Franklin said, hey, a stone wall has two sides. Um, and you can see probably the difficulty, because that's a pretty high wall, and that's going to cover the British just as well. Samuel, uh, who lived next door, and then John and Isaac, who lived here. So all three answered the alarm on April 19th. They were all present at the Battle of the North Bridge and in the fighting all along Battle Road. And so they were literally fighting their first battle in their own front yard. When Ephraim Hartwell came home the day after the battle, he was in his late 60s, so he wasn't a combatant. He, like many civilians, got out of the way. When he came back, he found the bodies of five British soldiers lying dead right out in front of the road. He put them in his ox cart and carried them two miles south to the center of Lincoln and buried them in the cemetery there. And they were in a mass grave and um, no headstone or anything. But in the mid-20th century, when they were digging a grave for, for somebody, they discovered that trench with the five skeletons. Now, the uniforms were long gone, but the buttons still identified them as British soldiers. So we know that that story is true. And uh, this is Hartwell Tavern, so we're going to stop here for a few minutes. I've got some water, so just sit tight and I'll bring it out. If you want to go in the house, um, we have a couple rangers in there dressed, uh, not like me, but dressed in period clothing. And um, I'm going to have somebody, uh, one of them, come out and fire a musket for you. So you get to see that. And then um, after we've refreshed ourselves, we'll move on and finish the tour. A cloth bag and stick it in here and squeeze it. With the, what's called the second press. Is this the second picture you got or the yeah. first? That's yeah, second. the first picture's over there. So that's the plaques. Can I feel that? Yeah, you can feel this. And there's also this is what it comes out of. Oh my God. And what the teenage boys would have done is they would have taken this stuff out to the barn. They would have, I'm just, I can show you we get to move back because this is really sharp. Wow, and this is like hair. When it's flax and hair and like Rapunzel, that's their friend. They've taken this stuff and they would eat it on the board like that, and really? it makes a lot of dust, so I'm not going to keep it. Uh -huh. Eventually, you can see it's starting to happen oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. 10, 20 minutes, maybe five, depending on who's For it. one section like that? Mm -hmm. All of this comes out, and you get this from wow. that, and then that gets spun. That's amazing. below my hand. So I'm pinching it with my right hand and I'm pulling the fibers with my left. And when I let go of what I'm pinching, it sends that twist up into all the loose fibers that I'm pulling out with my left hand. Um, and flax is very dry, so I need to keep my fingers wet and I also need to keep the thread wet at all times. And you can see that it goes from being this sort of very wispy, breakable substance to a very strong piece of thread, um, even though it's very thin. So, flax is just one substance that they would spin here. They also spun sheep's wool. And they would do that by, first, um, they would shear the wool from the sheep. And once it was shorn, they would boil it and after the wool is boiled, they would have to cart it um, because the wool is, is sort of all bunched and then the fibers are straightened out. So in order to prepare the wool for spinning, all the fibers have to be straight. So they put it on cards, which are basically pieces of wood with a wire attached to it, like a, almost like a dog brush. And they would just start combing through. And once they do it for quite a long time, you can imagine, not only did they have very strong arms, but they would also be able to straighten all of the woolen fibers so that eventually 
But when you peel it off, this isn't quite ready for spinning, but this is carded wool, which is ready for spinning. And from there, you'd actually spin it very much like you would spin flax. Um, one of the main differences being that even though the wool is boiled, it still has some lanolin left in it, so that you actually don't need to keep your fingers wet. Um, um, the wool also gets very sort of wrinkled as you spin it. So what they would do is when they're done spinning, and I can demonstrate the drop spindle in a moment, they would wrap it around what's called a nitty knotty, and they'd leave it that way for about three days until the yarn is very straight. And this was all spun here on the wheel we use for wool. This is called a drop spindle, and this has been used since ancient times. You can actually still see ancient hieroglyphs of Egyptian women who used the drop spindle. And it's basically the, the same idea as a spinning wheel, and it's actually the precursor to the spinning wheel. There's a little notch here, and there's a slip knot, and you just spin it with your hand, and as it's spinning, it's putting a twist into these fibers and creating the yarn. Um, so basically what the spinning wheel is, is the drop spindle turned sideways and attached to a driver band and a fly which keeps it winding itself. Um, colonial women could actually do this. You don't really have to, once you get it started, you don't really have to watch it all that much. You can do it when it's a little bit dark. Um, you can do it when it's a little bit dark and you, know, you just don't need a lot of light to do it. But you can see that it makes a really strong now, is thread. This, is this thread then used in weaving cloth? Yes, exactly. And what they would do, they probably didn't do a lot of the um, actual weaving here because um, it's just not big enough here to have a very large loom for yeah. weaving things. This makes linen thread, so it would make something like this jacket. So what they would do is they would spin their own thread and their own yarn and they'd send it out to town to be woven. And I know some people have been uh, looking at the wool before. I was showing you a bit on the drop spindle. So once you've spun the woolen thread, um, I think I had mentioned that you would, uh, once it's spun, put it on what's called a nitty knotty to straighten it and take all the wrinkles out that occur while you're spinning. Then once it's done, they would ball it. Um, and you can see, this is all yarn that was done here. And it's, it's very imperfect. It's thick and thin in some places. It has some knots in it, some little nubbies. And from here, they could knit or weave it if they wanted to. Um, they probably wouldn't have been able to do any large weaving jobs here because the large loom just wouldn't have fit here. So they probably would have sent it into town. These are um, examples of knitted uh, wool that was spun here. And this was actually not dyed at all. It's just um, different color sheep and all the yarn is, is knitted together to make this uh, striped bit. Welcome to the Hartwell Tavern, part of the Minute Mad National Historic Park. As Jim mentioned, my name is Tim. I'll be your friendly park ranger and musket demonstrator today. Hope you're enjoying the walk. It certainly is a good day for it. Uh, the musket, uh, a replica of the colonial musket uh, I hold before you today. There's just three main portions of the colonial musket. The lock, the firing mechanism, the stock, the wooden portion, and the barrel. And when I pull the trigger today, it's going to set off a number of different reactions that will hopefully result in a successful fire. Uh, what we do uh, when we first grab our muskets in the morning is make sure they're first unloaded. I'll remove the ramrod uh, and actually place the ramrod down the, the barrel itself. And if the weapon is unloaded, it'll be metal against metal. It'll make sort of a pinging sound. Let's find out if our weapon is safe and unloaded. What do you think? Unloaded? Good. We have a safe weapon. But when I pull the trigger today, after determining that it is in fact unloaded, I'll first put the weapon onto the half cock or safety position. The half cock position uh, prevents the weapon at all from going off. I can so pull the trigger. Uh, and this is essentially the safety position for the weapon. When I pull the weapon back into full cock position and pull the trigger, this is going to first, the what's called the cock of the weapon is going to spring forward and strike this piece of steel here called the prison. 
uh, the small stone that's inside the cock of the weapon here uh, will strike the steel and create a number of sparks. When I'm loading the weapon, I'm going to pour a small amount of black powder, black gunpowder, from the cartridge here into the pan. Now, the sparks will fall into the pan, igniting the powder in the pan. And that small explosion will travel through a very small opening in the barrel of the weapon, called a touch hole. The explosion will travel through that hole and ignite the main charge. When I'm loading the weapon, I'll pour the majority of the charge directly down the barrel, and with it goes the cartridge paper. And if I was fighting, uh, loading the weapon in a, a combat situation, there would also be a lead musket ball uh, in the bottom of this cartridge. Rest assured, however, today uh, in the National Park Service, we just fire black powder and paper, so you won't see any birds falling from the trees <laughs> that we fire today. A, a trained Minuteman and militiaman was expected to load and fire in about 20 seconds. I'll be, I'll be taking my time today for safety's sake, but uh, in duress, theoretically, someone could fire in about 20 seconds. And the result of a successful fire uh, of a approximately 0.7 caliber musket ball is uh, what you see Ranger Jim holding in front of you there. Uh, on this side is the entry of a lead musket ball into that piece of wood, and on the opposite side is the exit portion. So the first step in loading the weapon is to reach into my cartridge box, grab a paper cartridge, flip open the top, with one hand on the weapon and one hand on the cartridge, the only way of opening it, of course, is with your teeth, like so. I'll begin by pouring a small amount of black powder in the pan. I'll then shut the pan, cast the weapon about, and then the command was given then to charge with cartridge. Pour the majority of the powder directly down the barrel and with it goes the cartridge paper. The command was then given to remove your rammer and ram down cartridge, making sure that everything is in the breech end of the barrel where it belongs. The command was then to return rammer, like so. The weapon is loaded. I'll then shoulder fire lock, we'll take a few steps towards the field there. So the commands were then poise, fire lock, cock, fire lock, present, and fire. Poise, fire lock, cock, fire lock, present, I'm about to fire, fire. So if you can imagine for a moment 50 or 100 of these weapons going off simultaneously, which in a proper 18th century battle would be in fact the reality. There was a slave living with the Hartwells, owned by the Hartwells. Her name was Violet. So the Hartwells in their later years bought a slave. So slavery did exist in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was the first colony to legalize slavery and then the first state to get rid of it soon after the Revolutionary War. So we're just as guilty as anyone else on that score. Where we just were, that was Hartwell Tavern, and that was built in 1733. It was the home of Ephraim and Elizabeth Hartwell. They had three sons that served in the Lincoln Minuteman Company. Um, there was John and Isaac, who were still living in the house with their parents. They were in their 20s um, at the time of the battle. And then there was Samuel, who at the time of the battle was living here in his grandfather's old house. Um, and he was living here with his wife, Mary, uh, Mary Flint Hartwell. And so, the house here, what's left of it, was built in the 1690s by Ephraim Hartwell's father, Samuel. Um, it burned down in the 1960s, and actually there's a lot of foundations of colonial homes within the park and that burned down. And now you think they would have burned down when people were cooking with wood and open fires, but actually it's electricity that took a lot of them down. And this one here, um, it was the same thing, it was an electrical fire It took the house down. So what the Park Service did is we were left with the chimney stack and the cellar excavation, so the Park Service built a frame around that to stabilize what was left of the structure, give you a sense of the dimensions of the house, but also give you a rare opportunity 
to actually look inside and glimpse and see what an incredible massive structure a colonial chimney stack was. Normally, we talk about the central chimney in a house, but we never get to see them because there's a house in the way, so fate has conveniently removed the house, and we now have the chimney. Now, on April 19, 1775, Samuel, as I mentioned, was living here with his wife Mary and, um, and two, two children. And now, earlier in the evening, Ephraim and Elizabeth Hartwell had a slave, Violet, and she was out front. She saw British officers pass by. It was getting on towards dark, and they were darkly cloaked. And they rode past the house and then turned around and headed back east. And Violet ran inside. I guess they, they kind of spooked her. She ran inside and she said, Mrs. Hartwell, there's a funeral going by. Gave her the creeps. Well then, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, thereabouts, um, somebody's banging on the door at Hartwell Tavern. Samuel Prescott, he was riding out. Well, actually, he was visiting his, his fiance, Lydia Mulliken, in Lexington. He was riding home after midnight. Um, so I guess her father liked him. <laughs> and, uh, so he's riding home, and he meets up with Revere and Dawes, who tell, them, who tell him what, what was going on, that the British were coming out and they were alarming the countryside. So he determined to go with them and help spread the alarm. And it's lucky he did, because when Revere was captured and, and Dawes turned around, Prescott made it through, and he delivered the alarm to Hartwell Tavern. So now the whole house is in an uproar, and everybody's getting ready. John and Isaac are, are equipping themselves and getting ready to go up to the center of Lincoln to rendezvous with their company and then march to Concord. And Ephraim Hartwell sent, sent Violet down the road to wake up Samuel. And so she comes here. Now, she was remembering those officers, those darkly cloaked people riding by that gave her the creeps. Now this is just too much. So now she gets here and she wakes up Samuel's household and then is too afraid to go on. So while Samuel was getting himself ready for a march, uh, Mary went down the road and woke up Captain William Smith who lives next door and will be going to his house next. And then Samuel went and mustered with the company. And Mary Hartwell was telling this story to her grandchildren many years later. And she gives us one of the most vivid accounts of seeing the British soldiers march out. She said that she saw the army of the king marching up in fine order, and their bayonets glistened in the sunlight like a field of waving grain. They came by here at about 6.30 in the morning. And she said, if it hadn't been for the purpose they came for, it was the handsomest sight she ever saw in her life. And remember, her husband and her two brothers-in-law are out getting ready to fight against that very same splendid-looking army. Um, and so she and her kids stayed with, with relatives in the center of town, like most civilians that got out of the way. When she came back after the battle, she saw her father-in-law, Ephraim, loading bodies into an ox cart. And she was very afraid because she hadn't heard from her husband yet, so she didn't know if he was still alive or, or dead. And now to see her father-in-law putting bodies into a cart was, was very, very jarring. So she goes up to the cart and realizes they were British soldiers, so she was kind of relieved. But then she noticed, oh, wait a minute, they're people too. And she said that they looked very young. One of them in particular had a nice bright coat, and she took him to be an officer. And she thought it was a shame that their parents and their, their families would never hear what had happened to them. Now, Ephraim was loading them in the cart to take them up to the center of town to have them buried. So she said, since their families aren't here to mourn for them, I will. And so she and her kids followed what she described as the rude hearse to the cemetery in Lincoln where those soldiers were laid to rest, and they're still there to that day. So we talk about Minutemen, we talk about militia and British soldiers, guns and drums and bayonets and all sorts of things, but this happened to a whole community of people. And as I had mentioned earlier, women were instrumental in the revolutionary movement. They were very much an inspiration to the revolutionary movement, supporting various economic boycotts against Great Britain, creating homespun cloth that would allow them to support a boycott against Great Britain and then later supplying the army that was besieging the British in Boston. Just to give you a sense of how, um, how this was viewed during the period, the graduating class of Harvard in 1774 promised the ladies of Cambridge that at their commencement they would only wear homespun material. So to get that kind of a commitment out of the Harvard boys, I guess that was pretty good. Um, so anyway, but the good news is uh, Samuel did come back safe and he remained in the New England Army and the militia, took part in the siege of Boston, and he survived the war as did his two brothers. The major portion of Lincoln was the eastern section of Concord, Massachusetts. As the population of East Concord grew, 
more and more of its citizens found it too difficult to travel into Concord Center for religious and community meetings, a group of concerned citizens began a lengthy and frustrating process involving the general court, the Massachusetts legislature, and Governor William Shirley that ended with establishing Lincoln as a separate town in 1754. So Nathaniel Whittemore was living here and he got caught up in the whole controversy of Lincoln splitting off from the town of Concord because this actually used to be part of Concord. He was so upset that he insisted and got permission from town meeting to still maintain his address as Concord. Uh, so all his neighbors, including the Hartwells and everybody, they all lived in Lincoln but Nathaniel Whittemore, he lived in Concord. So he just maintained this little outpost of Concord. Um, but he saw the writing on the wall and he ended up leaving and um, I think he moved to Weymouth of all places. So why not move back to Concord? Who knows? Now in 1775, uh, this was the home of Captain William Smith, commander of the uh, Lincoln Minutemen. Now Lincoln had, uh, they were slow to embrace the Patriot cause. Uh, they were trying to find the common ground, but they quickly realized that there wasn't common ground in this fight. And so they ended up um, attaching themselves to the Patriot cause. And in March of 1775, uh, just a, pretty much a month before the, the battle started, um, they decided to form a Minuteman company, and they elected Captain Smith as, uh, well, William Smith as its captain. He was already serving as a lieutenant in the militia. He was a relative newcomer to the town of Lincoln. Um, he didn't move here until early in 1774. He and his wife, Catherine Louise Dodge, were living in Boston, and at the time, this property was owned by Catherine Louisa Dodge's family, the Dodges. And actually, her father had left this house and 100 acres of land in Lincoln to her. Now, back then in the 18th century, uh, when a man married, what's his was his, and what's hers became his. So Captain William Smith, by virtue of a good marriage, became owner of this house and 100 acres of land. When the British blockade went into effect and they shut down the port of Boston, uh, he left, he came out. Um, to take up residence here in, um, in Lincoln. So he became one of the wealthiest landowners in the town of Lincoln. Now, when we talk about the Minutemen and the people who, who took part in this part of our history, we owe so much to them because if it wasn't for them standing up, we wouldn't have this country today. And their imperfections seem to be hidden by a screen of 230 years. Except for Captain William Smith, his imperfections are so glaring that we can still see them today. Um, He's not a very good businessman. He had a tendency, uh, he came into his own when he was about 19 years old with a little merchant business. And he spent most of his time, uh, since he was living in Boston, a town that was renowned for its numbers of taverns. Um, he spent a lot of his time there, developed a uh, drinking and gambling habit. Uh, his father, uh, Reverend William Smith of, of Weymouth had to bail him out um, of his gambling debts time and time again and he married well and he comes out here and he's continuing the same pattern over and over again of failed endeavors. Um, but he must have been a very charming person, a charismatic drunk if you will, because the people in Lincoln seemed to like him despite his, uh, his imperfections and he was elected as captain of the, of the Minutemen. And not because he had any experience, he was only 29 years old at this time, um, but some believe because he was so wealthy and that actually made a difference in 18th century society. He was very stratified. Um, so that might have made a difference. Others believe it was because of his family connections. His sister, Abigail Smith, married a lawyer. And uh, we all know him, John Adams. And uh, John and Billy, they knew each other very well. They didn't particularly care for each other. And so William thought, of course, that, um, that John was a stuffed shirt. And nobody would ever care about him or remember him. Um, but this was his time to shine as the captain of the, uh, the Lincoln Minuteman Company. Uh, but anyway, so some people believe it's because of his political connections he was elected to his post. What's remarkable about Billy Smith is, is not that he had these imperfections, but that despite these imperfections, despite his alcoholism and his gambling, he rose to the occasion on April 19th and led the Lincoln Company very well. Uh, despite being engaged in the battle from Concord all the way to, to Charlestown, they did so without the loss of a single man. Um, he was absent for the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, he was listed as ill. Uh, some people believed it was a self-inflicted illness. He was passed up for command, uh, so he wanted a promotion to major. It didn't happen. He even asked his brother-in-law, John, to write a letter to George Washington, a letter of recommendation. John, not particularly caring for Billy, said uh, in the letter just said, um, my brother-in-law, William Smith, is looking for a promotion to major. What a ringing endorsement. Um, 
So he was passed up. He ended up going to sea on a privateer, um, captaining a, uh, a group of Marines. And his privateer was captured by the British Navy. He spent a year in prison in Halifax. And when he came out, uh, if he had a drinking problem before, he really went on a bender now. Probably not the only person to get out of uh, being a POW to come back a, a changed person. And um, ended up abandoning his family, and he died in New York in 1787. So it's a very sad story, but had he actually been killed at the North Bridge, like some people thought he was, um, rumors circulated that he was killed. Um, he probably would be a great hero today, but unfortunately he lived long enough to stain his reputation. Uh, these people, of course, we, you know, we honor them, we revere their memory um, because of what they did and, and the effect it has on us today um, as our identity as Americans. But we have to remember that they were real people. They weren't always perfect. They weren't stainless patriots. They all had their own particular interests and uh, shortcomings. Now, most of those shortcomings and bad habits have been erased by 230 years of, uh, of us honoring their memory. Captain Smith's uh, imperfections and bad habits are so glaring that two centuries later, we still talk about them. Now, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. Um, he did do what he, what he had to do on April 19th. He led his company very well. Eventually, the Americans enlisted a total of about 200,000 soldiers and sailors during the war. Battle casualties were 4,435 dead and 6,188 wounded. An estimated 20,000 Americans died of non-combat causes. According to data from the Daughters of the American Revolution, the last surviving U.S. veteran of that conflict, George Fruits, died in 1876 at the age of 114. Officially, the last surviving veteran is Daniel F. Bakeman. He died in 1869 and is listed as the last survivor of the conflict by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. Here's another grave marker. Interesting story about this one. Captain William Smith's wife, uh, Catherine Louisa Dodge Smith, um, there's a British soldier, a wounded British soldier, left on her door. Um, she took the soldier in and cared for him, but he was shot. I would assume he was shot in the gut, considering he ended up dying, and it took him a couple days to do it. Um, and the family cared for him that whole time. And when he died, um, he told, you know, in, in appreciation for the family's trouble, he said there was a gold sovereign sewn into the, the lining of his coat. And so when he died, sure enough, there was a gold sovereign. They buried him in front of the house um, on the south side of the road. And then in the late 19th century, they were doing some road work, and they accidentally dug him up. So he's buried on the north side of the road. No, excuse me. This is the north side of the road. That's the south side of the road. Just got a little turned around. So they buried him on the south side of the road. And then in the 1920s, they were doing some road work, and they dug him up. Um, so he's buried now directly across the street from us at a place called Folly Pond. So there he's finally been laid to rest. So um, it's unfortunate that he got dug up twice. Um, but however, we are still talking about him. So I guess he's achieved a little bit of a immortality there. However, we don't know his name. We don't know his regiment. Records are absolutely silent. In the village of Monotomy, now known as Arlington, the fighting was especially vicious. The exhausted and terrified British soldiers entered almost every house along the road and killed all the residents they could find. About 8 o'clock on the evening of the 19th, the British column finally reached the safety of its own lines across the river from Boston. They had been marching for almost 24 hours, the last six hours under heavy fire. They had suffered more than 272 casualties, including 65 killed. The Americans had suffered 94 casualties, including 50 killed. 23 towns had at least one member of their militia killed or wounded. Okay, listen my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. It was the 18th of April, back in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Now that, of course, was uh, lines from the poem Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Now, when Longfellow wrote that poem, it was published in 1863. Um, he had read the histories of Paul Revere's ride. He knew that Paul Revere was not the lone rider. He knew that Paul Revere did not make it all the way to Concord. Um, he had read the three accounts of Paul Revere. He knew what was going on. 
Uh, but in Longfellow's day, there was a, a definite distinction between history and poetry. And he wasn't trying to be historically accurate by writing his poem. In 1863, what was happening in America? Civil War. And naturally, people were very upset, particularly up here in the North, because the first half of the war was not going very well. The North had seemed to be suffering defeat after defeat. Uh, they had were beaten at Bull Run, and during the Seven Days Battles, they couldn't take Richmond. Uh, you know, McClellan wasn't moving fast enough. It did, they actually seemed to be in danger of losing the war. And of course, in that war, if they lost the war, then the Union itself would have been destroyed. And so they were facing the annihilation of their country. Uh, it was a very real danger. So people were very upset. So what Longfellow was doing was using the power of myth. Um, he took the story of Paul Revere and just kind of magnified it somewhat. So even though Paul Revere was one of dozens of people spreading the alarm, he was instrumental in setting up the alarm system. He was well known in Boston and in the countryside. He was a messenger for the Sons of Liberty. Um, but Longfellow made him into the one rider. And the idea, the reason why he did this was because he wanted to show what one person could do um, to save their country. Like if this guy can do all this by himself, imagine what we can all do together as a people. And if you continue on, if you read the whole poem, particularly when you get to the last stanzas, you can actually, you can really see what he's getting at. Um, you know, for born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and fear, the people will waken and listen to hear the, um, I'm screwing it up, but the um, people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight messenger, uh, the midnight messenger Paul Revere. Um, and so, it, again, it's meant to be very inspiring. So because of that, now later generations only read the poem and they don't read the history. So a lot of people, when they visit the park and they come to this place, the Paul Revere capture site, they go, he was captured? A lot of people don't know that. Um, but this is where his ride came to an end. Um, he had passed through Lexington. He met up with William Dawes, Samuel Prescott. They all three of them continued down the road. <laughs> And then that British patrol that had frightened Violet, the uh, Hartwell slave, earlier that night, they were waiting in ambush for him. And they captured Revere. Dawes was forced to turn around and then thrown from his horse. And then Prescott jumps over a pair of bars and then makes his way through the woods and comes up by Hartwell Tavern and then continues the alarm um, on into Concord. So the alarm still got through. So this is where the midnight ride came to an end. Now, Paul Revere, when he was captured, Major Mitchell, British officer of the 5th Regiment of Foot, asked him a few questions. He had his pistol to his chest, and he said, Sir, may I crave your name? And Paul Revere naturally gave his name, said, Paul Revere. Mitchell looks to his other officers and says something to the effect of, Ah, we got him. Um, this is the guy we've been looking for. And, you know, and he said, Well, what are you doing out tonight? Paul Revere saw no need to lie. He said, Well, I'm raising the alarm. And as you can hear, bells and signal guns and all sorts of stuff. He goes, I've succeeded in my mission. I've raised the alarm. And you guys, though you're marching to Concord, you'll miss your aim. And he says, what do you mean we'll miss our aim? And he says, well, you're going to seize the military stores. But you won't find them, and you'll never get there. 500 men were going to be waiting for you to offer you battle at Lexington. And so they took Paul Revere with them as they hurried back to give this intelligence to the British column that was coming out from Boston and um, they ended up letting him go. They took his horse and they let him go on foot. And he returned back to Lexington uh, to make sure that um, John, uh, excuse me, Sam Adams and John Hancock, who were staying in Lexington, to make sure that they would get out of the way um, because the British were, were coming and it was feared that they were going to be arrested. Uh, but unfortunately, the damage was done. That intelligence gets back to the marching column that 500 men are gonna be waiting to give them battle at Lexington. And then that was later confirmed by other people that the British happened to, um, to capture that evening that are on other errands. And one man who was riding in a, in a cart, bringing some milk to town, they captured him and they said, is it true that 500 men are gonna be waiting for us at Lexington? And this man said, 500? No, no, I heard it's more of a thousand. You guys are in a lot of trouble. Um, and so that might explain why the British were so nervous and trigger happy by the time they got into Lexington uh, just about dawn. So a rather unfortunate incident. But even though Paul Revere got captured, the alarm still got through. So obviously they weren't relying on one guy. They worked together. It was concerted action.
In Lexington, Captain John Parker and his Lexington militia were waiting for the British regulars to return. The Lexington men had lost a quarter of their numbers when the regulars fired on them on the Lexington Green earlier that morning. This time, Parker and his men knew what they had to do and waited for the regulars with determination. When the regulars were directly in front of his men, Parker got his revenge. His men opened fire with a volley that wounded Colonel Smith in the thigh and knocked him from his saddle. The front of the column stopped briefly under the fire, which was the worst possible reaction. As the rear of the column packed into its front, Major Pitcairn galloped up to get the regulars moving again. Pitcairn assumed active command of the column and sent troops up the hill to drive the Lexington militia away. Lincoln militiaman William Thorning crouched behind that boulder and killed two British soldiers in the road. So two shots, two kills. Now, there were some British soldiers killed on this stretch of road. Were they killed by William Thorning? Who knows? Now, just to play devil's advocate, notice where the stone is and where the road is. That's very close. So, okay, that's well within range of a musket shot, to say the least. That's practically point-blank range. So, reasonably, he could hit two British soldiers. However, when you saw the shot, when Ranger Tim fired the shot, what did you see coming out of the flash pan in the muzzle? Smoke. Okay, and it was loud. So, the British column, despite all their problems, you can imagine they would notice things like <laughs> puffs of smoke and loud noises and two comrades falling dead. Um, so he might therefore attract the attention of the British column and they will give him their undivided attention. Um, and he would not be around to tell the story of his daring exploits. Also, you've got the light infantry in the field, you know, coming through. So William Thorning is in a very difficult situation. He's caught between the hammer and the anvil. So did he really stay to fire two shots? Remember, one shot takes 20 seconds. Two shots takes 40 seconds. To aim, it's going to take a couple of seconds. I mean, so anyway. He was carrying two muskets? He must have been. <laughs> Just like in, um, like Val Kilmer in uh, Tombstone. He said, I got two guns, one for each of you. Um, <laughs> and he's a Doc Holliday. But anyway, according to local tradition, that's what he did, believe it or not. On orders from General Thomas Gage, British military governor of Massachusetts, 700 soldiers departed for Concord. Their departure was delayed for three hours while they waited for supplies. This delay gave the Patriots valuable now, according time. according to Nelson family tradition, uh, Josiah had a special job. His job was that if an alarm should be sent out from Boston by a Paul Revere or another rider, he was to ride north to Bedford and deliver the alarm there. So he somehow missed Paul Revere and William Dawes and Prescott riding past his house. However, he did notice when they were coming back this way um, under guard from British officers. He heard the hoofbeats on the road. So thinking that there was an alarm, came out, and in the darkness, didn't notice that the people he was confronting were British officers. So he said, are the regulars coming out? Oh, no. He hears in reply a sword being drawn from its scabbard. And an officer says, we'll let you know when they're coming out. <laughs> Wham! Hit him on the head. So bleeding and stunned, Josiah Nelson then went back to his house. His wife bandaged his head and he then carried his mission to Bedford. So according to Nelson family tradition, Josiah Nelson suffered the first wound of the American Revolutionary War. Believe it or not. <laughs> British troops under the command of Brigadier General Hugh Percy played Yankee Doodle as they marched from Boston to reinforce British soldiers already fighting the Americans at Lexington and Concord. Whether sung or played on that occasion, the tune was martial and intended to deride the Colonials. Nelson, uh, unlike Ephraim Hartwell, who had an innkeeper's license, meaning that he could sell uh, wine and spirits and cider and beer and have people uh, drink on the property and stay overnight, uh, Thomas Nelson was a retailer of um, spirituous liquors. So this was an 18th century package store. Uh, so you could buy it here and then take it home. So he was selling in bulk. Um, and according to tradition, a British soldier was left wounded 
um, here at the Nelson House who was cared for but then died. Um, and uh, there was another British soldier that died along a stretch of road. And so they're buried on a knoll uh, just on the, uh, the left side of the road over there. Battle Road continues on. Uh, the park, of course, ends at Fisk Hill, which is just about a mile from here. Uh, but Battle Road would continue on into the center of Lexington. That's where the British uh, received the reinforcements. Hugh Earl Percy with the 1st Brigade, about a thousand soldiers that saved the original um, 700 soldiers from inevitable destruction. And then the British, thus reinforced, made their way back towards Charlestown. And they still had to go through Lexington. They had to go through uh, Monotomy, which is today Arlington. Um, the town of Monotomy changed its name to Arlington. Well, at the time of the Civil War, it was West Cambridge. And then they changed it to Arlington following the Civil War um, in honor of their Civil War dead um, that were buried in the new uh, National Cemetery at Lee's Old Mansion. Uh, and then, of course, after Monotomy, um, Percy throws off his pursuers by taking the North Road towards Charlestown instead of going across the bridge at Cambridge and going into Boston from the south. So it was a very bloody day. As I mentioned, by the end of the day's fighting, 95 colonists were killed, wounded, or missing. 273 British soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing as a result of that day's combat. Um, 79 killed and the balance uh, wounded or missing. Now, of course, the British are in a very difficult situation. The Minutemen numbers are growing. Um, every hour, more companies are coming in. Ensign de Bernier of the 10th Regiment of Foot. All the hills on each side of us are covered with rebels. There could not be less than 5,000 so that they kept the road always lined and a very hot fire on us without intermission. We had first kept our order and returned their fire as hot as we received it. But when we arrived within a mile of Lexington, our ammunition began to fail. And the light companies were so fatigued with flanking, they were scarce able to act. And a great number wounded, scarce able to get forward, made a great confusion. Colonel Smith, our commanding officer, had received a wound through his leg. A number of officers were also wounded so that we began to run rather than retreat in order. So it's all starting to fall apart. Lieutenant Barker of His Majesty's 4th Regiment of Foot. We were fired on from all sides, but mostly from the rear, where people had hid themselves in houses till we had passed and then fired. The country was an amazing strong one, full of hills, woods, stone walls, etc., which the rebels did not fail to take advantage of. But they were all lined with people who kept an incessant fire upon us, as we did too upon them, but not with the same advantage but they were so concealed there was hardly any seeing them. In this way, we marched between nine and 10 miles, their numbers increasing from all parts, while ours was reducing by deaths, wounds, and fatigue. And we were totally surrounded by such an incessant fire as it's impossible to conceive. In this situation, we perceived the first brigade coming to our assistance. Hollywood really couldn't have planned that any better. Um, just as they were about to lose it, going over Concord Hill, and they catch sight of Lexington Center and then beyond the hills to the east, they hear a booming cannon and they see drawn up in line, in a well-ordered line of battle, uh, Earl Percy uh, with his 1st Brigade. Percy also brought out artillery. He brought two field pieces with him, six pounders. And he began to fire these field pieces from the hilltop and the balls would then go crashing down through the center of Lexington, through trees. Uh, the artillery didn't actually hurt anybody on that day. There were no artillery casualties, but it, it was very effective in scattering the militia. So one of the stories is that a Minuteman who had captured a British soldier was hiding behind the meeting house in Lexington and then a, a ball, a cannonball, had smashed through it, came bouncing down the aisle and smashed out the back uh, just about that far away from the Minuteman's head. So he then beat a hasty retreat and freed his prisoner. And as the story goes, as he's running away, um, he noticed that the British soldier is running right along with him. So apparently he captured somebody who didn't particularly like being in the British Army. Um, <laughs> So now I like this arrangement, I'm out of the army. But if Percy hadn't arrived at the moment that he did, um, the original column would have been completely wiped out. Uh, 700 men gone. Um, even once Percy came, they still had nearly 10 miles to go to get back to the safety of Boston Harbor. History's full of what ifs. You know, what if the Salem militia and the Danvers militia had got down and blocked Charlestown Neck and prevented the British from getting back? They would have all been captured or killed and General Gage would have lost nearly half of his garrison and he would have probably had to leave Boston within a few days. Um, so the war might have gone very differently. But as history would show us, they did make it back into Boston. But they suffered very heavily. Of the 1,700 British soldiers that eventually um, made their way back into Boston, 
273 were killed, wounded, or missing. Of the colonists, we estimate that somewhere between three and 4,000 Minutemen and militia had taken part in the battle along Battle Road. And so that's, that's no accident. This wasn't a spontaneous uprising. Remember, they had structures in place, Minuteman companies, alarm riders, and they mustered this force, and they all came from all over Middlesex County and beyond. So to get 4,000 men on the battlefield where they need to be to fight against the column was nothing short of amazing. And so they chased the British back across Charlestown Neck and then drew off for the night. Poor General Gage was told by Lord Dartmouth, the, uh, the British colonial secretary, that it was a small faction of people in Boston causing all of his problems. He said, just send the troops out, arrest the ringleaders, and disarm the militia, and this whole thing will just go away. Well, now he's faced with an army of 20,000 militiamen, because by nightfall, that's how many were starting to come in. One person who was there in Cambridge that night said that it seemed like men were falling from the clouds. They came in all over, and by the next morning, there were 20,000 militiamen encamped all around Boston. So poor General Gage looks, and he sees that army of 20,000 that appeared literally overnight, and none of them were from Boston. So I don't know if that quite qualifies as a small faction, um, but it didn't seem so to him. But unfortunately, they were all militia. A lot of these people left their homes that very, you know, that very morning upon receiving the alarm and didn't make any provisions for providing for their families so that 20,000 men didn't have any staying power so within a few short days and weeks this army started to disappear the Massachusetts authorities the provincial congress this committee of safety then had to raise an army a volunteer army that would serve until the end of the year that would stay in the field and so that work began and while that's going on and you've got the British bottled up in Boston other regiments are coming up from Rhode Island from Connecticut coming down from New Hampshire and they're forming a New England army and then of course the next major action was the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17th where this New England army was pushed off the hills of Charlestown but that failed to break the siege and then on the 3rd of July of 1775 something very important happens uh, General George Washington comes up to Cambridge and takes command he was commissioned by the Continental Congress with him came regiments from Maryland Virginia Pennsylvania, and this became, the New England Army became a Continental Army. And so that Continental Army was the one that was going to stay in the field year after year until the war was won. Now, John Adams um, was asked yeah, after the war, was asked about the revolution. He says to this person, do you mean the war? And he said the war was just a result of the revolution. The revolution existed in the hearts and minds of the people long before shots were fired at Lexington and Concord. Uh, it was a very difficult war lasting eight years, finally ending in 1783 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. Now Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, at the end of the war said that the American war is over, but the American Revolution continues. Only the first act <laughs> in this great drama has been brought to a close. And he was right, and the revolution did continue through all the deliberations with the, con you know, the um, Constitutional Convention, and then into the 19th century, where the work to uh, develop a political and a cultural identity unique to America um, was going on. And Concord played a major role in this. Once again, we had the Concord authors, Re uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, grandson of Reverend William Emerson. Reverend William Emerson actually died at Fort Ticonderoga in 1776. He died of camp fever. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, for the dedication of a monument at the North Bridge, wrote the Concord Hymn. And one of the lines, we know the, most, the, the first line, the most famous one, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. But another stanza, the last one, I think is also very interesting uh, for those who know Emerson said, O oh, thou who made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. And I think when he wrote that, he was remembering his grandfather who died in the Continental Army, who died to leave his children free. And so with that acknowledgement of the sacrifices of the past, the very next month in August of 1837, he launched right into the future. And he delivered an address to Harvard College called the American Scholar. And listen to the language he's using. It is definitely reminiscent of the ideology of liberty and equality that brought on the revolution. It said, our day of dependence 
Our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands draws to a close. The millions that around us are rushing into life cannot always be fed on the sere remains of foreign harvests. Actions, events arise that must be sung, that will sing themselves. We will work with our own hands, we will walk on our own feet, we will speak our own minds. And that was uh, celebrated as our Declaration of Intellectual Independence. We are to be not only politically independent of Great Britain, but culturally um, and, and intellectually as well. But of course, the revolution wasn't finished because a lot of people, particularly today, will look back and say the revolution did nothing for slaves, the revolution did nothing for women, the revolution did very little towards correcting a lot of the social evils that we still face today. And they knew this in the 19th century, like Henry Thoreau, that we've heard from earlier in this tour, um, asked some very critical questions because, you know, 50, 60 years after the revolution, the glow is somewhat dimmed um, and they can start to look at it for what it really was and see that it wasn't finished. And he said, do we call this the land of the free? What is it to be free of King George but continue to be slaves of King Prejudice? What is it to be born free and not to live free? What is the value of any political freedom but as a means to moral freedom? And he was speaking, of course, about the institution of slavery. He found that a great irony of the revolution that those who are standing in the muster field overlooking the North Bridge saying they will not be slaves to Great Britain own slaves themselves. Um, of course, it took us a four-year war and 620,000 lives to get that sorted out. Um, but then, you know, slaves are free, but women were not. Louisa May Alcott, also of Concord, in 1875, in celebration of the centennial, witnessed a whole celebration going on in Concord. President Ulysses S. Grant came out, um, and all sorts of senators and congressmen came out and had this great procession down to the North Bridge battlefield. They crossed over a new bridge that was constructed on the site, uh, and they were dedicating the Minuteman statue, that icon of American history. He's got his hand on his plow and one on his musket um, by Daniel Chester French, the uh, icon of the citizen soldier. Anyway, they're all standing on a platform giving speeches. She was very upset because no women were included. Um, I think she was somewhat grimly satisfied when the platform collapsed. Um, she said it collapsed due to senatorial ponderosity. Um, <laughs> But she also knew that the work wasn't finished, just like Henry Thoreau had when it came to slavery. And she said that patience has its limits. And there came a moment when the revolutionary spirit of 76 blazed up in the bosoms of these long-suffering women. We had no place in the procession. By and by, there'll come a day of reckoning, and then the tax-paying women of, women of Concord will not be forgotten, I think, not be left to wait uncalled upon. I devoutly wish that those who so bravely bore their share of that day's burden without its honor will rise up and rally around their own flag again and following in the footsteps of their forefathers shall utter another protest that shall be heard around the world. Yeah, so right. like, yeah. Here, here. <laughs> so just like Emerson, just like Thoreau, she's also using the language of the revolution, the ideology, um, to forward her own cause. And in 1879, she became the first woman in Concord to vote in a town election. But of course, it wasn't until many years later, in 1820, that women got the vote nationally. So that was then. This is now. The revolution continues throughout the 20th and the 21st century. And it's not something that happened in the past, it's something that's happening now. Like Benjamin Rush said, the American War has ended, but the revolution continued and we're all a part of it. There's no difference between us today and the people that fought here on the April 19th of 1775. The only thing that separates us from them is 230 years. So, a very difficult day. Ensign Lister, I think I'm gonna give him the last word on Battle Road. Uh, remember Ensign Lister, 22 years old, shot in the arm. Um, he gets back, uh, the British call him, they pass over Charlestown Neck somewhere between 6 and 7 o'clock at night. They flop down on Bunker Hill, they're exhausted. The colonists draw back for the night. They're not going to tangle with the Somerset floating out there in the Charles River. And now that the British have a good position um, to repel an attack, they say, okay, enough's enough, we've made our point. Um, so the wounded officers were ferried back to Boston first, Ensign, Ensign Lister among them. And he gets back to the house that he's billeted in, and of course the people, they were loyalists, and so they see this young man coming in, grievously wounded and bleeding, and they make a big fuss over him, and they say, you need to get right to bed. And he says, no, I would like a dish of tea, please. And they said, no, 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 you're lightheaded, you need to go to bed. And he says, no, I would really like a dish of tea. So it was then brought, and he said, the imagination may conceive, though words could hardly express the satisfaction I derived from the taking of that tea.